carbon filters should pull them out. Uh, we've had experience of that kind of things in New Jersey. We know that if we tell a community that everybody should put a carbon filter, which you can buy uh, on their water source, that a large percentage will not, and an even larger percentage of those who do, won't change the filter every couple of months and it needs to be changed. Um, and so putting a burden on the public to clean it up has generally not been very effective in my experience. Um, and so turning to the companies then, do you know of any companies that have solutions to cleaning up and recycling the flow back water? Well, there's a whole series of folks working on recycling. I mean, there's companies doing it as well. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're at the stage where people uh, let, me, let, me, let me be careful how I say this. Let me go back to history. Um, I mentioned I was in the public health service in the Vision Air Pollution years ago. I was stationed in Los Angeles in 1966, and I met a whole bunch of people who were about to become millionaires, they were sure, because California was about to put in rules saying that cars had to have so much pollution control on them, and the automobile manufacturers all claimed that this was absolutely impossible, it couldn't be done. But these inventors had ways to do it, and so they assumed everybody buying a car in California would have to buy their invention. Well, as soon as California did pass the law, it turned out that the companies could do it. None of these folks made a million dollars, because the companies did it themselves, and all the time had the answers. I don't know at this point to what extent all this talk about, yes, we can do it, or yes, we, no, we can't do it, uh, is talk or is real. I'm not sure whether uh, all, uh, sufficient demonstration projects have done to take something that seems to work in a laboratory and scale it up to the real world. Uh, there's always surprises when that happens. Uh, again, to me, it's just a matter of we need more time. One of the interesting things in talking to this environmental health director in Garfield County is he says his approach is to work very closely with the companies. And as he did so, he realized that they were constantly working on these solutions. And he said that one of the companies has a prototype of a, a, a closed loop system. And, and then there's a the question of how do you encourage that sort of system to be developed and implemented more quickly? There's no, the industry, I mean, they, these folks know, know their business. They've come up with these techniques to be able to uh, uh, exploit the situation which no one thought was exploitable. Um, they're technically very sound, and we've got to figure out ways to make sure that they put their technical skills toward preventing the, the stuff getting out. And as I say, it'd be in their benefit. They, it costs money, the fracking fluids. Yeah. So you did speak a little bit about what we do know are in some fracking fluids, but there's also been a lot of press about not being told what is in there. There's several questions asking, can we demand to be told what's the current status of knowing what's in the fracking fluids? Yeah, I think that the uh, um, that Gulf oil dispersant, that Corexit issue, um, the fracking issues are poster children for why we need to reform the Toxic Substance Control Act. There's a lot of push to get that reformed. The Senate Lappenberg in New Jersey has some bills in for a while. Uh, I doubt it will happen this year in this Congress, but uh, um, there's uh, the Toxic Substance Control Act is the act that basically if you've got a chemical, um, if you've got a new chemical, you have to go to EPA, you've got to show what the chemical structure is, and EPA has got, I think, 90 days uh, to basically say you've been manufactured or not. Uh, there's also a provision for old chemicals, and most of these are old chemicals. They were already there when the Toxic Substance Act passed in the 1970s. Uh, and that's not worked very well. Old chemicals are things like formaldehyde, methyl turk, butyl ether, uh, compounds like that, we just haven't done a good job of regulating. And the new revisions of the Toxic Substance Control Act all seem to aim at doing that. And it gives us more power to require testing, uh, thorough testing of you know, compounds that have been around for a while. These fracking compounds aren't things not known to chemistry before uh, in the past. They're just, I mean, just putting them together and using them in, uh, in, in scales and in ways that you, they weren't used before. I'm trying to, since we have limited time, and uh, my thought was to try to wrap up by about a quarter or two so people would have a little time to informally interact with you on the way out. I'm trying to focus on the health questions. And there are several about whether there have been studies, any past examples of disease clusters or health effects from hydrofracking in other areas. Uh, the answer is that there's been, uh, the answer to the question of, of has anybody seen disease clusters? And the answer is yeah, but people are reporting them all the time. Uh, 
have they been validated? Have we been able to go in and say, yes, this definitely is a cause and effect relationship? Uh, as far as I'm aware, we haven't. I'm, I'm very convinced. I've seen folks who clearly are having respiratory problems in their family that did not have before. And it sounds very convincing to me, but by the same token, I don't know that for a fact, and I can't be sure they wouldn't have gotten respiratory problems anyhow. You just, you're in this situation where um, we just need to be thorough, we need to really establish a cause and effect relationship. I do know, and I shouldn't say no, anecdotally, there are stories of uh, citizens who basically sued companies or threatened to sue companies because of problems they were having and where the company basically uh, provided funding with a non-disclosure agreement. You know, which means that, that yeah, I'll, I'll take your money and at this point, but I promise I will not discuss this ever again with anyone. I won't be part of any study or anything like that. Again, this is anecdotal. I don't know that this in fact has occurred. But this is something that definitely occurs uh, with drugs, it definitely occurs with tires. Uh, we know of uh, past instances where tires were being blown out and, and the company was basically uh, agreeing that they would pay someone, but they, as long as they didn't make it public, which meant that another tire would blow out and somebody else would get sick. So this is one of our problems of public health law interface problem that we have in this country. Uh, is it happening? Anecdotally, it is. I've heard that as well, and also in the context of is it possible to ban those sorts of agreements between them, between individuals and dance companies so that you can have more effective public health tracking, which leads into a question we have here about whether there is a registry in Pennsylvania for health complaints and whether you think such a thing would be useful. Yeah, um, the, um, our hope is that the Marcella Shale Commission, the Governor Savage, will recommend such a registry. The health department is moving ahead in Pennsylvania to establish one, uh, providing the, government, the, gov the, the commission recommends it and the governor accepts that recommendation. My impression is that they are hoping or expecting that to develop, but they certainly don't have it in place yet. We have a registry in the sense of, uh, uh, for the southwest in Pennsylvania, when people, people complain, they, we, we speak to them. Uh, we did 30 intensive interviews, two-hour health interviews, among people who were who were had complaints about a year ago now, and we're following up with them. Uh, we expect by the end of the summer to find out if those complaints continue or did not. But now remember, these are people who are complaining. This is not a random sample of the community or a. Biased uh, type of an approach to doing an epidemiological study, but as I said before, I think we have to understand what people are complaining about if we're ever going to really uh, appropriately approach the important study that needs to be done. That does um, lead into there's a, a several questions. Not surprisingly, about you talked a lot about research that needs to be done, studies that haven't been done, how important that is. But there are also a lot of reports and concerns about who's going to do those studies, where do they get their funding, and how does that funding affect the trust, the reliability, and the credibility of those studies? Yeah, good question. Uh, so let me tell you what I know what's happening. Uh, as of um, yesterday, I actually uh, spent some time with the Assistant Administrator for Research and Development at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. They're funding some major studies. They expect the results of these studies, and they're not they're mostly environmental studies, not health studies, at the end of 2012. That's, that's, that's a year and a half from now. And uh, we have a very effective uh, head of research and development at EPA, far more effective than I was when I had that job. But uh, there's no way in the world they've ever met any of their deadlines on getting the research study <laughs> not probably So I, I, you know, we're talking about probably two years from now before their studies are done. There's a major epidemiological study that is just being done in Texas at Rice University. As I say, my hopes is that we, my hope is that we will be able to do one in Pennsylvania uh, if the commission comes out with that recommendation. Um, and I, as I say, I think it's in the best interest of, of industry that that study be done. Uh, so we're hoping it will come forward. And, but you know, a major epidemiological study—it's a couple of years that it'll take us to know. Now, we're talking about something that's going to last at least 20 years. So we need to start, even if it's a little late in starting, it's not late in starting, we need to start. 
Several people want to know what you think about the movie Gaslight. <laughs> you know, I haven't seen the whole movie. I saw parts of it, and then I kind of read out something. Uh, uh, I, I, I just love those kind of movies. I think they're, uh, they're, they're, they're superb in making points, but inevitably they, they come with a point of view. We don't kind of know they come with a point of view. Fair enough. Um, several people are thinking about the, the comparison between being in New York and Pennsylvania. Wondering if you think that um, New York is rushing ahead too fast, if uh, why they are going ahead with it, if there are so many questions and there are implications that it's unsafe, and um, yeah, whether you think that the pace here is concerning. Well, again, I think New York, I mean, I, I think New York's people are graduating from Pennsylvania. I mean, we will be delayed at some, some time. Uh, I think you can make a more informed decision than, than we've been able to make in rushing forward to it. Obviously, I think you've heard my bias. I prefer us to basically say, let's wait a couple of years. I think that's unrealistic given the way leases work. Uh, I'm told uh, that there is a, at least one state senator in, in the state of Pennsylvania who wants to basically see if we can figure out a way to change the, the lease time situation so that there is not this uh, enormous push by industry to get, get this in as quickly as they possibly can. I'm also told by our public health law folks uh, that that's not possible under the Constitution in the state of Pennsylvania. I have no idea whether it's possible in New York. Okay. Um, so, and two, two last questions. Yeah. If frac fracking has the potential to contaminate our water and cause serious health side effects, why is public education not greater? Uh, why are we doing such a terrible job of educating ourselves about uh, problems? This is, I'm an educator, and, and I look back, and uh, I mean, I see a room like this, and, and the NIEHS Center, and I say, gee, we've come a long way. But in fact, uh, we just have so much further to go. Uh, as a long-range issue, I think supporting approaches that lead to better education, starting with school kids, about environmental issues, uh, is just central to all to our being successful as a society in dealing with obvious issues. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's just a difficult thing. I'm going to end up this long trip that you mentioned, uh, a family gathering in Bethlehem, PA, and I will once again be telling my brother-in-law, the dentist, that you cannot believe that global warming isn't happening now, can you? <laughs> <laughs> That would be a great place to stop, but too depressing. So, on a slightly more positive note, someone wants to know if you can give us any examples of success stories um, of where preemptive health concerns have stopped dangerous industrial techniques, and they don't specify whether that's just with respect to natural gas and Spanish Sure, uh, over and over again, we, we've seen lots of success stories. Um, just, uh, success in public health are things that don't happen. Uh, as opposed to success in medicine where you're sick and you, you get better or you don't get better, where you even see the outcome. Success in public health is, is uh, you didn't get sick and you didn't know you didn't get sick. But certainly our environmental laws are stronger. Certainly if you look at a state level, a state like New Jersey, uh, um, we've been able to prevent uh, a lot of the just sort of careless criminal activities of the past and just throwing chemicals around that's simply not happening. I think uh, the idea of the, the midnight dumping is, is uh, the hope of thing of the past, but certainly like closer to the past than before. We saw with fracking just by publicizing the fact that, a, that there were uh, a levels coming out of a treatment uh, plant. Uh, we went into the river, our folks in the, in, in the center I got there, went to the river, waited in there, got the samples, showed that there was a problem. And on the one hand, industry said, oh no, we got our things wrong, we we're under, we threatened a lawsuit. Um, the university, of course, is doing all its things because there's a lawsuit in the, in the works. But on the other hand, the state, and the, as far as we can tell, the industry is no longer using that as a way of getting rid of the water. And there's much more pressure on recycling. So you've got to keep fighting these issues. Um, People are making decisions in boardrooms, they're making decisions in governor's offices that we're not completely privy to. But they do include whether or not they can get away with things. 
whether or not the public is going to be upset, whether or not there is a way out, whether or not recycling will actually save them money, and maybe they ought to do it anyhow. Um, and they depend upon people being active and be willing to say things. So there are lots of good things happening based upon the past, but we don't know them because they aren't the bad things that would have happened otherwise. 